Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Sean Walsh. I'm a uh, field CTO for uh, going on four years at Lightbend. Uh, before that, I was out in uh, IoT, health and wellness uh, via Weight Watchers, um, solving problems at scale, um, particularly with uh, in the energy industry. <clears throat> so uh, about nine months ago, uh, I saw what we were doing with CloudState. Uh, Lightbend is behind CloudState IO, open source. And I was so excited about it. And I thought it was so revolutionary that um, I really just kind of, you know, was a proponent of it within the company um, to the point where um, Jonas Bonaire, my uh, my founder and uh, CTO and my CEO said, hey, how would you like to also be the cloud evangelist? To which I said, yes. So I'd like to talk to you today about cloud state, which uh, we consider uh, an approach to serverless 2.0. So Berkeley recently predicted that serverless is going to grow to dominate cloud computing. Uh, it's already happening quite rapidly. So why serverless 2.0? So function as a service was great. It was a great start. It's got limitations. It's a first step. It gives us some other uh, uh, ways of thinking that we didn't have before, um, but I think we need to kind of iterate on it now. <clears throat> so function as a service is not equal to serverless. Serverless has the potential to be much more. We need to allow coarse grain general purpose applications. We need to allow them, uh, not only allow them, but we need to be able to serve them in a way that uh, we can make guarantees around their performance, guarantees around resilience, and guarantees around their scale and elasticity. So function as a service, what is it good for typically? Um, embarrassingly parallel orchestrations, um, stateless web applications to a point, um, because a uh, uh, problem with function as a service is you don't know exactly what it's doing, uh, how much data it's trying to talk to um, in order to do a response. Um, so uh, as long as it's a simple stateful, it, it works really well. Um, job scheduling, orchestration, and more. What is it really kind of bad at? So reasoning about a holistic application. So a set of functions um, may comprise an application um, and something's very, very organized. Um, you know, maybe they have a good notion of their application within something like AWS. But for the most part, that's not what it is. It's just a lot of little low-level things. Um, it's not good at guarantees around responsiveness and resilience. Um, and it's not good at these general purpose applications. Um, when I say general purpose applications, I'm maybe referring to domain-driven design where you have what, you, what we call a bounded context, an area of functionality, which some would make a microservice. Um, I'd like to look at that as one unit. So function as a service gives us the tooling and the mindset of abstracting over communication, great. Um, so what happens is a message comes into the function. Uh, we don't need, need to worry about where it's living or how it gets instantiated, things like that. Uh, and then a message comes out, but what's happening in there? So there's a database in there somewhere usually, or databases in there. Uh, problem is we just don't know what's going on. There's no way to reason about exactly what's happening inside an individual function. So what's the problem? The function is a black box. So what's missing here? State, it's the elephant in the room. Application state, almost every application has application state. The problem is we've been relegating the state to the database and separating the processing logic from our application state. Um, and that can cause a lot of problems. It caused a lot of problems at Weight Watchers where we needed to handle uh, activity data, fit data uh, from Fitbit and things. And it was coming in and, and being routed to different servers that were stateless nodes and each going to the database and each making a decision and you're getting redundant data, all kinds of things are going wrong. So uh, serverless 2.0, we need to remove this real-time database access um, to allow autonomy and, and, and give real resilience to our functions. We can't make these guarantees if we're passing the entire database to a function or allowing unbridled reads or unbridled writes to the database. So with function as a service, we abstract it over communication, message in, message out. With stateful serverless, we're also abstracting over state. State in, state out. So state in, as you instantiate your function, the function has all the capability to fully answer questions. Message comes in, it does some thinking, message goes out, and then the new state goes out to somewhere. Um, so it can then actually hydrate again with its current state. 
But what is state? That's the next big question. So cloud state, this is our proposed solution to this problem using, um, using various uh, open source and methodologies that are well proven and that we're very comfortable with, but abstracting them in a way that is very approachable for everybody. So what is cloud state? I'm gonna read this verbatim. I won't do this very often, but cloud state is a distributed, clustered and stateful cloud runtime providing zero ops experience with polyglot client and database support, essentially serverless 2.0. It's also open sourced using best of breed Kubernetes, uh, 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 best of breed languages, uh, uh, tooling around those languages, um, and removing all the complexity of running an application in the cloud um, and essentially making it so a developer can uh, push a button or uh, put a, a command line in their build chain and it's running in their uh, in their environment. So you don't need to worry about distributed systems and their complexities and scale, <laughs> managing the state, managing your databases, service meshes, um, routing, failover, recovery, unhappy paths, happy paths, um, operationalizing your applications. So some technical highlights of cloud state. So it's polyglot. We support all of these languages and more. So. Python, Java, Spring, Go, Rust, JavaScript, .NET, Swift, Scala, uh, and, and more all the time. Uh, any So that for the most part with these languages, we use gRPC to embed um, the cloud state capabilities. So any languages that, can port, uh, that supports gRPC is fair game. So we have powerful state models. So event sourcing, I'm gonna talk in detail about event sourcing and how important it is. Um, CQRS, which is Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Um, simply separating your reads from your writes of a system and avoided, uh, avoiding something we call infamous mismatch, uh, which is an electrical term that uh, that says that at some point uh, you're going to get a mismatch between your domain design, which CKRS considers the command side, and your uh, your read of your reads of a system, which CKRS considers the query side. Um, you're going to get a mismatch at some point where they don't um, they don't really. They're not really fluid, or a particular domain uh, is uh, is in isolation against another domain, um, and you'd like to look across them. CKRS gives you ways to do this, um, and in cloud state we call it um, read projections, which is uh, we're we're just about to deliver that in our next version. Um, we can do key value, uh, of course, CRUD, create uh, create read update delete, and CRDTs, which are a little bit more of a advanced topic um, uh, around having highly available in memory data structures. And we're PolyDB. I mean, any, any DB that uh, that you'd like to run in, in cloud states, it's perfectly okay. Uh, SQL, no SQL, new SQL, spanner, uh, or in memory. So we leverage ACA, um, ACA open source. ACA is a reactive toolkit, um, very mature, uh, highly, uh, highly scalable, uh, high throughput, um, really, really uh, just takes away you know any any uh, any of the challenges that we had to you know synchronize uh, across objects and things like that. Actors uh, actor it's an actor based framework um, and actors are bounded by mailboxes, so you don't have to worry about any contention. Um, gRPC uh, really nice uh, nice way to uh, have a, a little bit lower level communication, uh, type safe communication between things and APIs. Um, K native Graal VM so. Uh, if you're running on a GVM, you don't need to worry about it because we will compile to a native image that gives us the ability to scale up and down incredibly quickly. Um, and all this running on Kubernetes. So this is an interesting quote that um, that Jonas Bonaire found. It's actually from a, a theologian, but it really fits here. Freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding the right ones, the liberating restrictions. So one very important restriction or constraint that we found um, that allows us to do these things is event sourcing. And I'll talk a lot more about this now. So I don't know how many people are uh, familiar with event sourcing. Um, it, it, in my experience, uh, the companies and the business didn't care so much about it when you're designing the app, but they really cared about it when they were getting into analytics and into machine learning and things like that. Then it became very important. And they were lucky I, uh, I I put it in there in secret early on. So um, you get a single source of truth with a full history of what's happened on your domain. 
Um, you, it allows for this in-memory image, this storable in-memory state that is so important for stateful serverless. It avoids that object relational mismatch that I talked about, um, uh, impetus mismatch between your domain design and the, the read requirements of your system, which is always different, almost always. Um, it allows subscriptions to state changes via the events. Um, another thing about events is events, they exist in every business and every concern, whether they're being harnessed and utilized by the developers um, and the programming is another, is another thing. A lot of times they aren't, but the business still has the notion of events. You've got um, a bank account opened, you've got um, account debited, account credited. Those are things that happen. It's, it's about designing your system to match the events. Um, it has high mechanical sympathy, single writer. It's, it's, it's write only, one direction. Events travel all the way through. You could subscribe to them. Um, uh, and, and when you use it in, in conjunction with CKRS, um, you're only ever writing to the system, which will result in an event, or you're reading from a system based upon events in the past. So with now event sourcing in cloud state, here's our deployment. We've got our user function, which we can also consider a, a domain entity, um, which could also be considered an aggregate root in domain root design. And, um, and so now what happens is, remember we had state here. We now know what state is. State is the event log. Uh, it, the things that have occurred on a particular entity was an entity. Maybe it's a, uh, it's a device within a wireless mesh system. Um, and I've got these, each of these is a user function instantiated in memory in my cluster. So the event log comes in when you start this thing up, when you start the system up, or when the request comes in and it wishes to use it for the first time. Um, and the event log replays, builds up its current state, however it does it. And now it's ready to take new commands, which says, hey, uh, turn off the device. And the reply comes out, accepted, I accept that command. And maybe the event goes now back out to a, a, an event log somewhere, a database. Um, and it says device turned off or something like that. So the happy path, an event sourced um, function is a command comes in to the function. It enters the mailbox uh, because the function might be busy doing something else for the previous command. And then does a little bit of thinking and says, yeah, that's, that's a valid command. I'm going to mutate my state, and I'm going to now issue an event that, uh, that, uh, that says I mutated my state. Um, that goes to the event log, but it also gets shared with the outside world. Any interested party can observe these events, including the query side of your system. So the unhappy path. What happens there? So there was a failure. Maybe a node went down, uh, unhealthy. Something happened. Uh, uh, it could be any number of things it happens with distributed applications. Um, so you've got your event log. You replay the events. Um, and also, if you're if you're wondering, um, with event sourcing, you have the notion of snapshot. So um, you could always start with a snapshot of your state and then replay the the uh, the less number of events over top of that to build up your state. And now you're ready for business. So yeah, you can still do CRUD. If you really want to do CRUD, uh, you know, some very simple systems, CRUD's perfectly fine and it's appropriate. Um, you could do it and this is how we do it. We use just that snapshot by entity key. That's your state, it's now in memory. Now you're ready to do business, message in, message out, uh, and then snapshot back out when you've uh, changed your state. So, a little bit of the architecture behind cloud state. So on Kubernetes, this is how we're actually, we, this is our low level um, strategy on how we're able to scale so reliably and really take advantage of any particular user function uh, is scaled across pods. So that means that um, there is going to be, um, there's gonna be a, a different instance, across, however many pods you wanna add. Now these user functions, they are um, they are stateless, but they've got um, a counterpart in in cloud state backed by Akka that is not redundant. It's part of a cluster. That's your cloud uh, cloud state proxy accurate sidecar. So even though you have these different stateless, um, uh, they're they're holding gRPC. Um, they're um, they're allowing you to reliably you know hit your service at scale 
um, but you're still going to get bounded by a mailbox of a singleton that represents that piece of domain on the left side. So they communicate to your uh, whatever language you've written this in. Um, the sidecar communicates over gRPC. Um, they're they're co-located in Kubernetes, so that works perfectly fine, very fast. And um, and you get access to your data store, whatever that might be, through cloud state. <clears throat> so the cloud state architecture shows the sidecars running in each pod, and then the um, the sidecars actually comprise an ACA cluster with all kinds of you know. Uh, gRPC capabilities, gossip between replication, routing, um, all the niceties around um, um, resilience, uh, healthy nodes. You know, if one of these things dies um, and another one's brought up, ACA cluster knows how to take advantage of it um, and shift things around. So as a managed service with cloud state, so um, let's, let's say that you've got a DevOps team that, may, that takes the open source and makes it available. Or, uh, or someone like Lightbend actually creates a managed service um, using cloud state with a lot of capabilities around you know, uh, automation and, and support and stuff like that. You get to pay as you go, you get you know, on demand, you get this passivation of failover, don't pay for what you're using. Um, you get complete auto scaling, uh, zero ops, so all the message routing and state management, deployment provisioning upgrades, um, blue green, all that stuff you get, you just get for free. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and so, multi tenancy is another little bit of a, a differentiator, I think. Um, so, function as a service, in, in some cases, maybe the bulk heading is okay, depending on the vendor, but um, typically or, or often enough, a neighbor's function or another customer's function running on AWS maybe, can actually hog up resources. It's, it's not always true bulk heading. In cloud state, it's from the ground up because of the pods and Kubernetes. Um, the bulk heading requirements could be met um, just about how you're setting up Kubernetes and your installation. Um, uh, you get complete bulk heading, even at the data level, different database per, per tenant, um, complete security during these clear separations. So I just wanted to, to show the difference in what it looks like with a typical three-tier architecture and a reactive architecture, which is the really what uh, cloud state is fundamentally based on. So this is what we're really used to. We're used to uh, building these applications with a, a middle tier. In the middle, you'll see the four nodes. And um, requests come in, they hit a load balancer. They go to any one of those four nodes. The, those nodes are really, they're, they're quite hobbled because they don't have the state. They're always beholden to go into the database in real time to get state. And they have to hope that while they're doing that, and thinking and then writing back that another node is not doing it on the same piece of domain. Uh, and you can see how noisy this is. With a reactive architecture, you're going to see that that real-time reliance on the database is now gone. The database is really a side effect of state change uh, and doing business, but it's never, it's never attached to the request response cycle. So the requests still come in from the left. They go into the cluster at any entry point. Um, the cluster uh, locates the piece of domain um, in memory across any one of those four nodes, uh, and uh, and it, it, it will mutate state and it will synchronously write the uh, the new event to the database. But the user is not waiting for any of that. So you truly have a middle tier that's doing all the work here. So the cloud state architecture, just to show you how we've kind of laid it out, you know, you've got your database options on the bottom. We've got we really lean on Kubernetes. K-native, uh, native image with Graal, um, and, um, and then all the capabilities of ACA. And then above that, you'll see the boxes of the different methodologies that we support within ACA. So we've got event sourcing, CRUD, domain projections, which is that CQRS read side. Key value, um, you can effectively get an in-memory cache with this if that's what you'd like. Um, and CRDTs, conflict-free replicated uh, data types. And this shows the languages that we support um, they're they're changing quite often, um, and then um, uh, Istio. We're showing that in the picture um, for uh, you know how we're doing a service mesh in Kubernetes, and then you could use gRPC, HTTP, REST, Kafka, um, Camel, or uh, uh, Alpaca, which is the reactive library similar to Camel. Um, you can have any any kind of entry point like that. So let's look at some code. Do a quick time check. 
So uh, I wrote a sample app um, and I actually did three user functions. I, I did it as a bounded context and it's a reservation app that will let you um, uh, do flight reservations, hotel reservations, and um, and car reservations. And I did it because I was we're partnering up with a um, uh, an open source uh, called Cadence Cadence IO, uh, and that does workflow. And uh, they're using that at Uber. And I wanted to do a proof of concept to how a Cadence uh, might do a a transaction or a saga against three of these different domains in in uh, Cloud State. But I'm only going to show you the flight side to give you simple today. So the first thing to look at is you define your uh, your protobufs. You, uh, you define your interface to the outside world. Uh, if you're and this is going to be a Java application. Uh, so what I've done here is these are the things you can do. This is how you interact with your application. You can reserve a flight. And if you haven't seen gRPC before, um, when you say res reservation ID equals one, user ID equals two. Those are the positions of those attributes in the in the structure, um, and we're also um, marking reservation ID uh, is in that cloud. It's going to be the entity key, the unique key for cloud state for that particular function that's in memory. Um, so that's how you reserve a flight. Uh, I'll show you the service in the next slide, and then you can cancel a flight reservation. Um, you might want uh, to take a look at a flight reservation, what it might look like in its current state. Um, so you'll see that there's a reservation ID, user number, flight, user ID, flight number, whether it's canceled or not. Um, and then there's a, a get flight reservation command uh, where you issue the command, uh, the reservation ID, and the service will actually give you back a flight reservation. So I'll show you that now. So the flight booking service, this is in the same, I couldn't fit it all on the same screen, but it's in the same file. Um, you could, I'm going to show you something very cool here. Um, so you can reserve flight, and that, that's going to take, so this, you can see how type safe it is compared to REST. Um, it takes a reserve flight command, which we defined above, and it's going to return empty. Um, I actually like to, in practice, return accepted. Um, I don't like to give the impression um, in a reactive system that the caller is going to get back the result of what's happened, because you really don't know how long it's going to take or, uh, or that the event went to the event log without problems or anything like that. So you just want to be able to say, hey, my best effort. If you'd like to know that if it failed, that's going to be on another, another path. You're going to now subscribe to that or something with a failure event. Um, but what's really cool about this is this is gRBC. But you see that we have this option, Google API HTTP. Um, and you're actually implicitly supporting a post. Um, it's going to take a REST post now. So in, in, in addition to gRPC, you automatically have REST support. If you open the, open the appropriate ports in Kubernetes in your YAML file, you'll you'll have REST and gRPC or one or the other. Um, so you don't have to create any routes or you don't have to do uh, you know um, uh, spring controllers or anything like that because you get it for free. Um, so one other um, proto file is our actual domain. We we define that out also as proto, so we can share it freely. Um, and what I've what I've created here is just the two events for my flights. Um, flight reserved, it's a business style event. Um, it has all the appropriate information for a reserved flight and flight canceled. And that's all we need to do. So in our build, we just, we used Maven for this. Um, it, it generates these proto sources that are available to our project after the first compile as Java code. So this is, uh, this is the meat of your function. This is what you would call your user, user function. Um, so you just annotate it as an event source entity, um, and you just say, hey, what are what are my attributes? I have a reservation ID, a user ID, a flight number, whether um, it, it's it's the flight's yet reserved not or not, whether it's canceled or not. And then I've got a typical Java constructor there, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm letting the Cloud State Framework instantiate this, uh, and I'm saying that the entity ID is the reservation ID. And then uh, when I'm instantiated, I, I set my reservation ID to um, to that. And so then you're, uh, it's a matter of your um, handling your commands and handling your events. So the commands are the outside world messages coming in. I need to be able to handle those. And you take my state and issue events. The event handlers are, the event exists already. Now it's being called back into me because I'm reinstantiating um, or 
I'm getting a call back because the event successfully went to the event log and, uh, and now I can successfully mutate my state. You don't want to mutate your state within the command handler because what if the event doesn't get to the event log? You'd be, uh, you'd be out of sync. So you'll see in the command handler that I reserve a flight I do a couple of little rudimentary checks, make sure nobody's trying to do it twice. Uh, make sure that they're not trying to reserve a canceled flight that's previously canceled um, by the user. Um, and then what happens is I create a new um, event of flight reserved. I emit it to my cloud state context where cloud state is going to take care of getting into the event log and all that stuff. It's going to make sure I get a callback and then I'm returning empty. I'm not really returning anything in real time. Um, and then the, the event handler will happen immediately after. I'll get called back um, with flight reserved, and then I'll set my internal state within my instance here um, to whatever was in that event. And now I'm now completely up to date with my state. Now, this is the command handler of uh, what it looks like for the get flight reservation. So this is where you wanna see what the current state is. Um, and so I'm just re returning that structure um, with the contents of my state within my function. So the last thing to do is deploy it. So there are some steps to actually installing Cloud State. Um, if uh, the, I'm going to leave you with the link to my uh, GitHub project, and that's got a full readme with how you can actually set up Cloud State uh, with, with Minikube and how you can actually uh, deploy this in there. Um, once you have all those things in place, you know, there's a number of steps that have to be done to do that. But this is all you have to do um, to deploy your application. Within my project, I've got the um, uh, the application YAML file where I say, what is the image in my build file? I'm building a dev image. Um, and I'm saying that's the image I'd like to use to deploy um, into a pod. Um, and you can deploy, you could say the number of pods here, all kinds of things you can do. You can open up ports for different things. And then the command is, to, is just simply apply, cube control, apply, minus F, deploy, bookings.yaml, and give it a few seconds and it's running. And that's it. That's deploying your application. So on behalf of our uh, Cloud State IO team, I'd like to say thank you. Um, this went a little faster than I thought, uh, but the, the full sample you'll see there that uh, I'll leave it up here for a few seconds. That's my GitHub account. Um, and uh, please try it out, pull it down, uh, push it in there, uh, play around with the pods, uh, hit it with some, uh, giving you some examples of how to actually use a gRPC client and 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 uh, create flight, car, hotel reservations and pull them back down and things like that. So I'd uh, love to get your feedback if you get a chance, but uh, thanks a lot. And uh, I am ready for any questions that might come up. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. We'll have a look we'll for sure. Look for sure. So, so maybe this time maybe someone this time would like, someone to, join would like to join live and ask a question directly. directly. If if you'd like, to do, you'd that, like please, to do that, please um, uh, click, click share video, video and audio, and, audio. And, I and I will let you in. Okay, so let's okay, continue so let's with. Continue with questions from questions from the from, chat from the chat um, um did you use did you use a cluster for scaling, scaling purposes, purposes if yes, if yes what, about what about is a stability is um yeah we use that cluster uh the cluster is completely scalable reliable um if you're using it correctly um you know it's it, you could you could use that cluster i've seen it in the past um, and you could actually uh, do things with actors you're not supposed to do. And it may not behave as well as if you're using it in the way that is really prescribed. Um, so in my experience, and I've been using it since 2010, or as long as Cluster has been there, which is probably 2012, um, it's always been 100% reliable. Um, but the reason for Cloud State, one of the big reasons is we're trying to make this easy. We're trying to make this very approachable. Uh, cluster and ACA, you know, it, some of it can be a little bit advanced. We try to actually do away with that. That's why we have it behind the scenes. So we're trying to make it much more abstracted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, the next question is, is, when should one, one consider, consider using, using FAST over...
over server I think this relates to server as the strong framework. framework. Yeah, so if you've got if you've got like a fine grain function just to do something, um, maybe you just want to count logins um, or something that's cross cutting or something that is um, maybe uh, uh, what's, what's the one? embarrassingly parallel. Um, uh, maybe you'd like to do a transformation on something where uh, take something that came in a, in one form from Kafka and then put it in a database where it could be picked up from somewhere else. I think those are probably really reasonable for a function as a service. I'd say if you've got a fine grain problem uh, and it's not really what, what we call standard application, I think that's a good use for function as a service. You need to be able to know that you've got something that's going to be simple, um, that that black box, you've got a good idea that it's not dangerous, that very little is going ins on inside that function. Okay. Uh, let, uh, me let me mute you for a while, for a while when I'm reading, when the, I'm question reading the question because question. we have yeah. echo. echo. Um, um, one of the fast benefits, benefits, benefits is that you pay, that as, you pay as you go. Is it possible, is it possible with, with, cloud, with state? cloud state? Oh yeah. It's, um, so the, your, the the only the pods that are going to be instantiated are only going to be the ones that are needed at any given time. So your application will have one pod. And as it gets used by more and more users and it gets busier, maybe it's 100 pods. Those will go back down to one if you're not using them. You're not paying for what you're not using. That's all automated. Mm -hmm. Sure. sure. Um, uh, what happens what if happens you lose, if you lose um, Kubernetes um, pod? Do you have do to you have reply to the event, recover, the, recover state? the state? If so, if so does, it happen, does it happen automatically? In addition to that, yeah, addition um, to that um, do you use operator, do you use operator, pattern, operator maybe? pattern, maybe? Uh, which pattern? Uh, operator uh, pattern operator in Kubernetes. Uh, we yes, we are. We uh, so we did an operator to enable Echo Cluster to um, to interact with the pods, um, and we we use operators. Uh, so how does it work? We do leverage Echo Cluster, which already has this capability. And using the operator, you're able to the pod dies. This is what I call the unhappy path. Echo Cluster automatically knows how to actually now um, move a, move a given persistent actor, which is what's behind this function to a healthy node upon demand. So when there's a failure, that's what occurs. And then the given we're using event sourcing, we know how long it's going to take to reinstantiate this thing. So it's it's highly available. Hey, thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, what about uh, split what brain, about split brain issues? Uh, so we have split brain resolvers in, um, in cluster. Um, we don't as yet have it in cloud state, but we will. Very soon. So cloud state's only at this is only the first version of it. Um, we uh, even at the cluster, there's a there's a split brain resolver now. Um, so we'll have a split brain resolver um, strategy in place for for cloud state. There's about seven that are possible. Mm -hmm. And the last and the question, last question is, um, is um, oh, we have more of them. Do one have do to rely, have on, to clustering rely on clustering for achieving, for achieving failovers, failovers or downtimes, downtimes managing, managing states, states in cloud state? Cloud state? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Well, let me let me read that again. Um, do one have to rely on clustering for achieving failovers or downtimes in managing states in cloud? Well, you do. Yeah, you have to. We we use uh, Echo Cluster under the cover because it has those capabilities already. Um, and then since we have the operator um, on it, we get now the pod integration with that. So our cluster spans the pods. But Echo node dies, pod dies. They're they're equate. They're um, yeah, they're 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 equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And and. The very last question. Very last question. Um, actually, um, could, actually you could you elaborate on, on event sourcing? Event sourcing. Um, um, how you can, how you can a little bit, a little um, bit about, um, about how, how to sell, how to this, sell business. this business. So the, this, the, this is a big conversation. So state, let's talk a little bit more about state. I like to say state is in the eye of the beholder. 
when you're not using event sourcing, event sourcing is a business, it's a business um, construct. It exists. CRUD is just, we've, we're so used to it. Um, and we just write systems like that. But the problem with CRUD and the problem with de defining our own data structures is that they're our idea of what something looks like for our purpose. But what happens when you've got other systems that uh, like to look at the same thing for another purpose? Um, you get you get problems, and what typically happened with that is something like SOA. Um, in and I have an example of problems that came up with that. So at Weight Watchers, we had the notion of user, and everybody needs a share user. User user was a mile wide. Um, you you couldn't make any any sense of why it was why these attributes were there. What were they? There really should have been a notion of user in different contexts that look different depending. Um, that's that's kind of the the way we support it. Um, so events are one way. They are not trying to please everybody for everybody's viewpoint. Events are hey, I've got a particular kind of domain. It's customer, and you just added a customer. You just added a customer contact. This is the way the event looks. If you don't like the way it looks, you could subscribe to it and paint your own picture somewhere else. Event sourcing just makes a lot of sense. It gives the ultimate flexibility, but most important. We developers aren't inventing the data. We're not inventing things. The domain comes from the business. How we view it comes from the requirements. Thank you very much.